Good morning. Good morning. Yes, our numbers are, are kind of uh, down uh, today. Yeah, we've got a lot of folks out. Uh, uh, the Jones uh, husband and wife both recovering from surgery. Uh, that kind of makes it difficult for them to minister to each other, you know, at home. They're, as they both go to help each other, it's the ow, 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 I'm going to help, ow, ow, and it goes back and forth kind of thing. So anyhow, well, we're going to keep them in prayer. Uh, one of the, uh, the Brentzel family, one of the kids woke up sick this morning, so they're, they're going to stay home. Uh, Nanny, she's, she slept wrong a couple days ago, so she's uh, having a lot of discomfort with, with her neck. And, so, and of course, Janice and Deonda are uh, worshiping with us uh, at home, so hello to all of them and others that, are, that may be tuning in. So... Uh, we do have some of uh, some of that that you know Facebook is telling us that we have we have other viewers. So anyhow, we're going to say hi, hello to everybody. We are going to continue our study of the identifiable church within the New Testament. And you know, at at, at first you might think, well, you know, is that really a subject that needs to come from the Sunday morning pulpit because you kind of think, well, this should be more of an evangelistic thing. But really, when you think of what evangelism is all about, which is what? Seeking and saving the lost, right? You can't seek and save the lost into something you don't know about in the first place. There are, there are a huge, there's a huge number, there are a huge number of, of doctrines being taught and I know from my personal experience that there are different lessons or different ideas as to what salvation, uh, the salvation process is. And so that, for that reason, this is a very important subject for us to, uh, uh, to be looking at. Up to this point in our series, we've shown that the church Christ promised he promised this to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. I will build my church, right? That church is identifiable. We are now going to begin to show the nature and pattern of the New Testament church. This, the nature and pattern, these are the identifiable marks. Everybody has a fingerprint. Nobody's fingerprint is the same. Uh, it, it's, it, it helps to identify the individual. And so what we're going to be looking at today is basically that fingerprint of the New Testament congregation. Uh, the giving of the Old Covenant. First of all, we, we have to look at this because the Old Covenant had identifiable marks. Anyway, it's beginning. Let's look at, look at a passage in, uh, in some... Some passages in the Old Covenant. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, the first three verses, it tells us there, when Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and ordinances which I am speaking today in your hearing, that you may learn them and observe them carefully. The Lord our God has made a covenant with us at Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, with all those of us alive here today. These passages that I'm reading are telling you uh, with whom God made the covenant. Exodus chapter 19. It shares with us in the first six verses there. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord, God, uh, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. We need to note here, when he says, you will be my own possession, that ownership that God places there is dependent upon people following the ordinances which he is here enacting. Okay? But again, he's giving these laws and ordinances this covenant is being given to the sons of Jacob alone. Uh, chapter 24 of Exodus, the first eight verses. Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and you shall worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come up with him. Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with twelve pillars for the twelve tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins. The other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the blood of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. They said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So again, these texts are showing that this covenant was made with a specific group of people, that this covenant was enacted with blood. The, the book, the altar, the people, they all had this blood sprinkled upon them. And so we also need to look at who this covenant was not made with. Let's look at Exodus uh, I think it was Exodus 19. I'm missing a note. Verse 3 of Exodus 19. Again, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and the sons of Israel. And we read this. this. This again is who the covenant went to, who the covenant was given with, who the blood of the covenant was sprinkled upon. And so it goes without saying, everybody who is not of the house of Jacob did not receive this covenant. Okay? It's not that they weren't going not it's not that the covenant wasn't going to be made available to them because it was the Israelites were told to proselyte the peoples around them but again the covenant was initially made with the sons of Jacob and again it was dedicated using animal blood Exodus chapter 24 uh, verses 5 through 8 uh, pointed that out to us but I want to go to Hebrews chapter 9 in Hebrews chapter 9, there is much teaching there in this book regarding uh, covenants and sacrifices. In chapter 9, verses 18 through 20, it tells us this. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. Every first day of the week, we, we commemorate, uh, we memorialize the sacrifice of Christ, because as in the New Testament, the beginning of the church, the apostolic teaching regarding the Lord's Supper was that they did... This every first day of the week. And Jesus said, take this blood. It is the blood of the covenant. Right? He says, drink from it, all of you. And so that's why we, that's why we do that. So anyway, this, this passage here is saying that the old covenant was also uh, commemorated uh, with blood. 
Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Let's look at that text. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. And there is uh, His blood. And that holy place being that, uh, 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 that access point under the old covenant, that access point to uh, God the Father. So, how long was it supposed to last? Now, if you were in class this morning, you have that answer. But just to remind everybody, there was a point in time in which the Old Covenant was to end. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, says specifically what that time point would be when it says, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator, until the seed should come to whom the to whom the promise had been made. Verse 19 is basically telling us, Paul is telling the Galatians there in chapter 3, he he encapsulates in these few words the, the old covenant promises, the Old Testament prophets, what they promised, what they what they were telling the people was to come. They were, they were telling the people all of these prophecies about Jesus. And so again, he says, until the mediator, until that seed should come to whom the promise had been made. And so all of these prophets were pointing to that seed. Who is the seed? It's Jesus Christ. So when Jesus came, and we read earlier, at the point of his death on the cross, That's when the Old Covenant ended. Uh, Verse 16 tells us that Jesus is that seed. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say unto seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. What was the purpose of the Old Testament? Well, let's let's first, first look at what it was not. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, it tells us that uh, no one could be made righteous by it. That no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith alone. The old law could not justify anybody. Um, It was unable, according to Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 8, it was unable to free anyone from the law of sin and death. What's the law of sin and death? It's, this, it's, it's simple. If you sin, you die. That's what the, Romans, uh, the letter to the Romans teaches us. In, in Romans chapter 8, it tells us there in verses 2 through 5, <clears throat> the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do Weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit." And so it's telling us that the law could not free anyone from the law of sin and death. So again, you know, what what was its purpose? Well, we know that it wasn't to make people perfect because according to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 19, it couldn't do that. The law made nothing perfect. Let's go on to verse 18. For on the one hand, there's a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. It is saying that the old law was set aside. Why? Because it was weak and useless for the purpose which the Hebrew writer is here talking about. The law made nothing perfect, and on the other hand, there's a bringing up of a better hope through which we draw near to God. That better hope, of course, is the new covenant. So it couldn't free anyone from uh, the law of sin and death. It couldn't justify anyone. It couldn't make anyone perfect. Uh, And it could not make the worshiper perfect. 
This is more specific because in Hebrews chapter 10, the first 10 verses, what it is saying is anybody who draws near to God cannot be made perfect in doing so if they attempt to worship God according to anything in the Old Covenant. The law, for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices year by year, which they offer continually, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been claimed, would no longer have had a consciousness of sins? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. We mentioned this in class. That what happened to the sins under the old covenant is that they were rolled forward year by year by year. And the Colossian letter tells us they were rolled forward to that point wherein Christ was on the cross, was able to forgive all those past sins. Verse 4, for it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the roll of the book it is written of me. That's talking about the old covenant there. That, that scroll. To do thy will, O God. After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What that passage is telling us in Hebrews chapter 10 is that Anybody who desires to worship God can only have their sin problem resolved if they do so according to Christ under the new covenant because the old covenant is not going to perform that task. It can't. It can't. That's why it's described as being weak and useless. What then, again, was its purpose? Look at Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. <clears throat> In Romans 3, 19 and 20, we find um, there's, there's, there's four things that we're going to look at here. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed and that all the world may become accountable to God, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So these four things, it, it, was, it was for those under it. It's not for anybody else. Uh, God's expectation then is, is, is obedience by its adherence. In other words, if somebody is going to say, okay, I want to follow the old, old law, they are, are by that statement expected to adhere to every aspect of it. Nobody was able to keep the old law. It required perfection. And, and because the Roman letter says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that, is, that includes all. Everybody in the past, everybody now, and everybody, and everybody in the future. And because all have sinned, we all need the same thing. We need forgiveness. Forgiveness was not offered under the old law. It was to stop boasting mouths. Nobody could say, I'm perfect. Because if anybody tried to say, I have not sinned, the old law showed to them that they can't make that statement. You know, we have examples in, in the New Testament where people have come up to Jesus, you know. Uh, uh, what... what uh, what should I do to inherit eternal life? You know, Jesus provides this list. The young man says, I have done all these things. Jesus says, one more thing. 
He was not willing to make that sacrifice. He was not willing to help people out whom Jesus said would always be present. There will always be poor. Always. There is no government, no law, no taxation that will ever remove the poor from our midst. Never will it happen. The helping then of the poor comes down to those who are able to whatever extent. If it's as the woman who put in only a penny, or Zacchaeus who gave four times. Yeah. Stop boasting, boasting mouths. It was also to bring guilt upon the world. Nobody likes guilt. Nobody. So we, God provides that to us by helping us to see why we're guilty. But God doesn't leave it there for us. You know, He's not going to say you're guilty and then walk away. You know, He made us with some kind of survival instinct. I don't want to be guilty. I've got to fix this. Acts chapter 2, verse 37, they said that it says they were, they were pierced in the heart and said, what shall we do? They felt their guilt. They felt the pain of their guilt. And verse 38, they were told what to do. It was to give the knowledge of sin. Those four, that was the purpose of the old law. It was for those under it, it was to stop boasting mouths, it was to bring guilt upon the world, and it was to give the knowledge of sin. Help people understand what's right and what's wrong. Boy, this is the world that needs to understand what's right and what's wrong. You know, the, oh, yeah. It should be understood that the covenant, when it, was, when it passed, it included the Ten Commandments. Because the commandments, these, the Ten Commandments were... Were, they were called the old uh, uh, the law, uh, the old covenant. Exodus chapter thirty four, uh, verses twenty seven and twenty eight. Then the Lord said to Moses, "Write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel." So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. Is that my phone going off? That's really going to have an adverse effect upon the video that we're trying to record. Really, we can't not receive spam on the Lord's Day. Okay. Where was we? All right, Exodus 34, uh, 27 and 28. I have made a covenant with, uh, with uh, you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat bread or drink water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So if God says, if the Scripture tells us that the old covenant is removed at the point of the arrival of Christ, Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, that would include the Ten Commandments as well. You know, I, I'm... I am at a quandary. It's kind of a paradox when you have most courthouses in, uh, uh, in, in each county in the U.S. will have the Ten Commandments. A lot of them do. And I'm thinking, you know, they should be removed. Because we're not supposed to follow the Ten Commandments. But then I think, you know... How many people walk by that courthouse and have never opened their Bible to read those ten things which we have just read from the Roman letter were provided to help people experience a sense of guilt, to experience a sense of an understanding of sin, uh, and, and to cause people to want to look for a resolution to those feelings of guilt. 
So sometimes I tell myself, well, just go up there with some duct tape and cover up the fourth one. You know, because that one's not in the New Testament. That would be okay, wouldn't it? I'm not really defacing something because I'm not scratching it out. I'm not ruining something. I'm just, I'm just emphasizing some things. I don't know. Anyway. There's three other passages, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 13, Deuteronomy 9, beginning 9 uh, through 11, 1 Kings chapter 8. They all tell us that the Ten Commandments were the Old Covenant, which God removed. Let's look at the identifiable nature of the uh, Old Testament. <clears throat> In 1 Kings 18, I got 15 minutes. 1 Kings 18. Got to get through 2 Samuel here. Beginning in verse 20. I thought we were going to be talking about the identifiable nature of the new covenant. Well, I think it's good for us to understand that the old covenant had identity. Right? Why would God not provide identity in the new? 1 Kings chapter uh, 18, beginning in verse 20. It says here, So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now, let them give us two oxen and let them choose one ox for themselves, cut it up and place it on the wood and put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood and I will not put a fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God and I'll call on the name of my, uh, of the Lord, uh, the God who answers by fire. Uh, he is God. And all the people answered, said, that's a good, that's a good idea. That's a pretty, that's a pretty good test. You know, if, if your God answers by fire, we'll worship Him. If my God answers by fire, we'll worship Him. Folks, this story is given to us to help people understand there's only one God. So you ask, why doesn't God do this kind of thing today to help us understand there's only one God? I would have to say that God is proving Himself every day in various ways. Those things are not going to be 100% understood until everybody gets to the pearly gates and recognizes God was working or for the first time understand that God works, which is kind of too late. John tells us these things were written so that we may believe and that believing we can have life in his name. This story tells us that Elijah watched 450 prophets jump around, do everything that they could do to get their God to burn their sacrifice, and it never happened. But God answered Elijah's prayer. And that was after even pouring water, not once, twice, but three times over his sacrifice to thoroughly wet it down. When I was on my camping trip in Alaska, I tried everything I could one night to get a fire going. I was tired of being wet. It wasn't real cold, but the dampness makes it colder than what it really is. I could not get a fire going. Elijah did. The answer to Elijah's prayer reveals to the world the identifiable fact that there is a God and that his people, whom he calls, worships him. In Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, we find that two-post concept. 
Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient to that form of teaching from the heart to which you are committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Again, that word for form in Romans chapter 6, verse 17, is that Greek word tupos, which means form, mold. You, 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 you pour the, the, the plastic in the mold and you get that same thing that you're trying to create, whether it's a bowl or whatever else. But anyhow, it's, you get that same thing. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, it, 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 it talks about this some more. It says here, He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His kind intention which He purposed in Him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times. That is summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things upon the earth. In Him, in Him also, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to His purpose who works all things after the counsel of His will. That's the pattern that Romans chapter 6 follows. There is identity in the way in which God summed up all things. He works all things in and only in Christ. Not Mary, not Muhammad, not Mormon, and we can say at this point, etc. Only in Christ. Verse 11 here is stating that God planned His work and then worked that plan. All things have been summed up in Christ. Millennialists teach that Jesus failed His plan, postponing His kingdom to a future time. But this creates some problems. Besides creating a weak God, besides creating a God who is not all-knowing, because if He was all-knowing, He would have known that His Son, whom He bore through the Holy Spirit and Mary, okay, He would have known that Jesus wasn't going to be able to fulfill the teaching of the kingdom is near and at hand, right? So he can't be all-knowing. And if he can't be all-knowing, and he in the form of his son, according to John chapter 1, that would also mean that he is not all-powerful. That's not the kind of God we worship. We didn't see that in 1 Kings when Elijah is praying to God, would you please accept this sacrifice and ignite it for me? so that all can see that you are God and you alone are God. If he's not all-powerful, he could not have been able to do that. The other problems, though, is that it makes the prophets liars. The Old Testament tells us that if a prophet says something and it does not come to pass, he is not a prophet of God. However, if it does come to pass, he is a prophet of God, which means the prophets of God did not lie. It also means that the New, Test that the New Testament passages lie. We cannot, as John says, have eternal life based upon believing the things written if the things that which are written aren't truthful. Jesus came and died in order that there would be a kingdom upon which everybody who believes, everybody who repents, everybody who confesses, and everybody who is baptized gets to enter. God's Word is authoritative and undeniably so. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 8, You shall not do all what we are doing here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. This is seen to, to be proven so in Judges 21, 25, when it shares, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And our job 
The church's job is to make known and teach for God who created all things in order that the manifold wisdom of God might be now made, made known through the church to the rulers, the authorities, and heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians 1.27, it says, We, the church, and no one else, speak God's wisdom. What is God's wisdom? It is that good news of redemption in Christ. In a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined, meaning foreordained through the prophets before the ages to our glory. We have the task of sharing the undeniable nature of the New, Te New Testament church, for therein alone lies salvation. People need that. We must do as Timothy was instructed and hold the pattern of sound words to Timothy 1.13. And in so doing, we'll be able to fulfill the greatest task meeting the greatest need, which is nothing other than leading lost souls to Jesus Christ. Amen? The lesson is yours today, so if there's any need that you have based upon what we taught or having nothing to do with what we shared this morning through God's Word, whatever you need, won't you come forward while we stand and sing? Why did